Why some Jews give up religion. Many people have left religion because in their learning and spiritual perfection they betrayed their unique personalities. For example, a person may be naturally talented in matters of agada and be unsuited to constant immersion in the matters of halakha. Yet, because he does not recognize his unique talents, he occupies himself in matters of Gemara and its commentaries, since he sees that this is customary in the religious world today. But deep inside his soul, he feels a hatred towards the material he is learning, since constant involvement in it does not suit his unique natural gifts. However, if he were to find the specific type of Torah that fits his unique talents and immerse himself in it, he would then immediately recognize that the nauseating feeling he experienced when involved in matters of halacha was not coming from any flaw in that holy and important type of learning. It was rather his soul expressing its desire to be absorbed in another type of Torah. This person would then stay faithful to the Torah and become an expert in the type of Torah that is unique to him. In fact, he would even be able to help those who are more talented in halakha by showing them the inner peace of agada, poetry and emotions. Unfortunately, because this person does not recognize the true reason for his feelings of nausea towards halakha, he forcefully ignores his nature. And as soon as the path of the non-Torah way of life opens up to him, he breaks out and then hates and becomes an enemy of Torah and religion. He will go from one sin to another. It is from these types of people that haters of our people are created. They try to proclaim a new vision and blind the eyes of the world. There is a great diversity of wisdom that expands even greater than this. One may be strongly attracted to a certain secular wisdom. Such a person must also follow his unique talents, while setting aside fixed times for learning Torah. If he does this, then he will succeed in both, because Torah together with the way of the world is beautiful. Puke Avot 2 Mishnah 2 And the Gemara at the end of Yoma discusses how to find the right balance of priorities for such people. In general, this whole issue is dependent on each person's unique soul. Don't lie to your soul. One should not lie to one's soul. One should not deny one's inner emotions due to the whirlwind of external approval. If one feels inspired and holy in a specific area of learning, then one must constantly satisfy oneself from this deep pleasure that one's heart desires. As for me personally, I am filled with a powerful sense of divine satisfaction when I study mystical Torah. Even if I know that this form of learning is abstract, I must be strong inside and not remove myself from it. Obviously, one must also give time to practical needs, whether concrete actions or the practical parts of Torah and wisdom. Finding one's own unique spiritual diet. There is a well-known principle that a person should not journey into the Pardes or Kabbalistic fields before first having filled his or her stomach with meat and wine, referring to Tanakh or Gemara. Perhaps this is referring to a person who only wants to fulfill the basic obligation according to the letter of the law. However, for one who feels within one's heart a strong passion to learn profound ideas, the correct principle may be as follows. One should always learn Torah in the subject matter that one's heart desires. Avoda Zohar 19a The very fact that one has a special talent in philosophical or mystical subject matter is itself a proof that the will of God is for this person to be immersed in profound ideas. And furthermore, any idea that has become essential for one's quest for God 
and without it one would feel a severe lacking, becomes for such a person the meat and wine. This is not in conflict with the principle against journeying to paradise, for that is only referring to matters that are beyond a person's essential needs. Therefore, one who feels a deep intellectual and emotional pull toward the understanding of God should be confident in his or her ways and sure of success. Of course, there is no question that one should set aside enough time to learn the basics of Torah and its laws in a proper way. Nevertheless, one's main learning should be in the subject matter that one's heart is most passionate about. And if one looks around and sees that most people are not behaving in this way, one should realize that for these people it is not appropriate to enter the world of profound thoughts until they first develop in a gradual way. In addition, a person must be careful not to grow arrogant, for this is all really dependent on the natural differences between souls. We may go even further in saying that one who has the natural urge to know all these profound ideas in a clear and organized form will not be able to truly connect to God without journeying down this specific path. It can be compared to eating a diet that is wrong for one's body type. Certainly, one who does this will feel naturally weak and tired, even though another may be completely healthy on that same diet. Therefore, we must be careful not to compare one person's diet to another's. Thus, one who is naturally drawn to profound and deep ideas should not be intimidated by others who are not. Instead, one should realize that this is one's personal obligation. Of course, it goes without saying that despite all this, basic types of learning should not be abandoned completely. Nevertheless, one must know that one will never be satisfied until special attention is given to that which one's soul demands. Only then will one be successful in serving God with a truly deep sense of happiness. Torah of Soul versus Torah of Law As a rule, poets know how to describe the finer side of life its beauty, its energy and its flow. They also know how to describe the evils of life and to protest against them forcefully. But it is outside the ability of the idealistic imagination to uncover the particular details of how to effect change upon even the most minor defects, which can have very destructive consequences. This falls within the realm of a type of knowledge that deals with details. Here begins the work of physicians, economists, engineers, judges and all those who pursue practical wisdom. Profits, their strength and weakness. This distinction has even wider application. The prophets saw the great evil of idolatry in ancient Israel and protested against it with all their might. They described the beauty and bliss associated with the belief in one God. They saw all the moral corruption, oppression of the poor, murder, adultery and robbery, and they were inspired with the Spirit of God to solve and prevent these conditions through lofty and holy speeches. And yet, the little lapses from which the main body of sin developed remained hidden from the eye of every prophet and visionary. It was not within the sphere of prophecy to grasp how the regular performance of mitzvot and study of Torah would slowly release hidden inner wisdom and eventually vanquish the darkness of idolatry. Nor could it grasp how the gradually increasing carelessness in the details which undermines the performance of the mitzvot would start a process of corruption letting human passions and the straying imagination run wild. We have abandoned the soul of the Torah. A letter to Rabbi Yehuda Leib Seltzer, 
Chairman of the Union of Orthodox Rabbis in America, January the 4th, 1913. We must not ignore the basic medicine that is capable of healing everything. It is only because we have abandoned it that our downfall has come about. It is the thing that my poor and bitter soul has become accustomed to speak about and repeat hundreds and thousands of times. We have abandoned the soul of the Torah. This is the great cry that contains in it the power of generations upon generations, from the days of the prophets to the ancient sages, from the greatest rabbis of the Middle Ages all the way to the wisest of the current era. For too long, the most talented among our people have focused almost exclusively on the practical aspects of the Torah, and even then only on specific sections of it. Yet the emotional, philosophical and all higher spiritual wisdom, where the secrets of redemption and salvation are hidden, we have totally abandoned. In fact, if a person came and complained about this great deficiency to the leaders of the Jewish people, he would be considered arrogant and absurd. The great voices of the philosophers of God, of the most exalted Hasidim, of the purest Kabbalists, who came with the secrets of God, the holy visions of courage, who waited and anticipated redemption, are like a lonely voice calling out in a desert wasteland. For too long we have delayed dealing with this issue. Consequently, atheism has slowly arisen before us in its thick, disgraceful, dark filth. It snatches thousands of souls from our people each year. Yet, despite this, in our own camp of Torah and faith, we find only darkness and no clearly defined desires and goals. We are therefore being called to return into Shuva in an enormous way. It is specifically at such a moment of crisis and danger that we need to take the greatest of all medicines. Yes, we must be radical in our approach. Any form of compromise will not solve the issue. Faith has been lost and it is continuing to fade away because we have abandoned the Torah and there's no one to interpret and search out its secrets. At the present moment, Orthodox Judaism is fighting defensive and foolish war that tries to argue that the outside world is destroying itself and that all of its values and beliefs will simply be destroyed along with it. But the fact that secular Jews are more likely to fall apart than us is not an actual consolation or comfort. Truly, the suffering of the masses is not even a half consolation, but rather a double agony. Pointing fingers at the sickness of our people will not bring strength and life, since this attitude is pessimistic by its very nature. But why do we need to talk, walk such a winding path when we could instead walk the open and straight road that stands before us? What we must do is re-establish the spiritual understanding of the entire Torah. Indeed, any person whose heart is filled with courage, whose pen is filled with strength, and whose soul is filled with the Spirit of God is being called to march out into the streets and cry out loud, let there be light. Keep the larger vision in view. The goal of Torah learning is to internalize the main principles of the Torah, so much so that this knowledge gives power to the details of every part of halacha. This can be compared to the way that a healthy heart delivers blood to each limb. Indeed, without such a clear level of knowledge, every detail seems as if it were a separate and alienated entity. This creates confusion at the very essence of the Torah and blocks a person from serving God with love and freedom. And the word of God came to them a little here and a little there. Yeshayahu 28 verse 13. Words of Torah must be seen as one vision and one mitzvah. The demand for holistic spirituality. 
the widespread chutzpah that we are told will occur during the times of Mashiach comes about because the world has reached a stage in which people demand an understanding of how all the details of the Torah connect to a greater goal. Even one detail that is left disconnected from the greater goal causes this generation to have no rest. Now, if the world were involved in this type of Torah, so that one's soul would rise up to perceive how all the details fit into the greater goal, then Teshuvah and Tikkun Olam, universal transformation, would come about. Yet, because of laziness to uncover the light of the inner Torah, destruction has come into the world. Therefore, we must use the greatest medicine of all, an increase in our spiritual talents, until the understanding of how all the many ideas and actions of the Torah are connected to a greater purpose that will be self-evident. Only then will the power of spiritual life, in action and knowledge, appear in the world.